So I'm outside the Thames Valley Police Headquarters here in Oxfordshire. I'm about to go meet the Chief Constable, John Campbell, as he's marking his final week in the role. He's stepping down after 34 years as a police officer. Shall we go meet him? We are involved these days in an awful lot more um, of, with people who are in mental health crisis. And that's because of some of the pressures on the National Health Service. You know, the file preparation that my officers need to do when they're prosecuting cases, the time that they're asked to spend on that for the purpose of the courts and the prosecution has significantly increased. And everything that you do that chips away at their available time, and ultimately, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a greedy chief constable. I want as many police officers as we possibly can. But I have around about 8,000 staff in TVP. And some of my police staff, who aren't police officers, do very operational roles call handling, contact management, investigations, crime scene investigations, the list goes on. But I have around about 4,800 police officers to police and protect around about 2.7 million people. And crime has changed. You know, we have more fraud reported to us now than ever before. You know, we're now in the world of where cyber crime is reported to us. We get more online offending that is, takes place than suddenly it was, you know, 10, 10 years or so ago. So it's, it's, it's trying to balance the, the priorities for the force against the numbers. Now, we've, we've had some welcome increases in numbers over the last three years. You know, the Government Uplift Programme has given us an extra 609 officers, which we've recruited on top of our normal recruitment. And the Police and Crime Commissioner is funding another 80, which is really welcome. We lost, you know, big numbers earlier on during austerity. You know, we lost around about 750 and about 950 police staff when we had to reduce our budget. So we're still a little bit under what we had before, um, but really welcome numbers and uh, some new fabulous recruits joining policing. Rape, sexual assault, domestic abuse have been priorities for policing for many years. The terrible catalyst of the murder of Sarah Everard and the reflections on all of us in society about how women and young girls are treated in society was something that made us um, galvanise our efforts um, and tolerate much less crime and inappropriate behaviours towards women and girls. And we have a part to play as the police in that. So we have seen an increase in our rape prosecutions. We have seen an increase in our stalking and harassment. We have seen an increase uh, in our sexual offence conviction rate and detection rate. And we only want to get better at that. At the same time, working with partners to make sure that the environment in society for women and girls to go about you know, their lives is as good as it can be, free from harassment, free from kind of like criminal behaviours that make life intolerable. We can never be complacent about such things. You know, I've had instances where I have had to sack officers for behaviours that have no place in policing. So you can never be complacent as an organisation. But what I would say is that the last time TVP were inspected by our inspectorate, they talked about how we had an inclusive and ethical culture within TVP. They talked about how hard we work with diverse communities. They talked about how we use stop and search fairly and properly and how we, how we treat members of the public with respect and how we use force properly and fairly. And those are important things for me to hear as a chief, but the important thing is never to be complacent. Because as I say, we need to look at the findings that were about the Metropolitan Police, as you said, but making sure there's nothing in there that we shouldn't look back and reflect back on ourselves to make sure we're the kind of police service that maintains the trust and confidence of people in Oxfordshire. Well, remarkable times, really. I mean, you know, as a police force, we had to do the normal day job, you know, because that didn't stop. It got a little bit less. There were less people going out at night, obviously, because of lockdowns. You know, people weren't moving around. But we had a society and a community that felt very frightened by what was happening. So we needed to be a, a force that reflected a degree of normality. Um, we were still out on patrol. But for the first, you know, until we got the vaccination, for a number of months, my officers were exposed to... The, the, the kind of like the, the virus in a way that others weren't because we can't ask police officers to stay at home. They need to be in the workforce or in, in the workplace. And they wanted to be in the workplace and they wanted to be out there helping the community. And then we also had the tricky thing to manage, Jordan, where we kind of had to impose new regulations on people, you know, new, new fines that were kind of frequent and changed a little bit over time. And so we had to brief our officers and staff to try and get it right 
to enforce where we needed to, but encourage and explain where we could. Um, and so I, I think, you know, from my point of view, I'm very proud of how the force responded to that. I was very proud of the way the officers and staff wanted to really put service before self. Well, yeah, you touched on one of the, the, the saddest uh, parts of my job, and certainly as chief, one of the, one of the more difficult times. So Andrew was killed responding to a report of a quad bike being stolen and was unlawfully killed. Um, and the court found uh, the offenders guilty of manslaughter. But it was just responding to a normal type of crime that even now my officers and staff will be responding to. When you lose a colleague um, in those circumstances, um, there's a sense obviously of great sadness, um, but also a determination to bring people to justice, but in the appropriate way. But at the same time, certainly with Andrew's death, the community outrage was, was significant. And I, I got correspondence, as the force did, uh, from across the world, um, uh, passing on their condolences and their outrage at, at how Andrew died. So a really difficult time for the force, but more, impo but more importantly, a terrible time for the family. And Lissy and, and Andrew's family all suffered the loss of somebody, but in the public, in the public, um, in the public domain. Mm. But of course, Lissy, in particular, has since gone on uh, to 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 get legislation changed, uh, in effect, around the sentencing of those people that would cause harm to emergency workers. And um, so, I, I, from something so so sad and terrible, something has come through Lissy's and the Police Federation's mm. endeavour to protect officers and staff going forward. Mm. So I'm definitely going to miss it, that's my starting point. Mm. There'll be a bit of time just to relax a little bit. I'm on, uh, as Chief Constable, and I ask for no sympathy regarding this by the way, I'll just mention it, is that I'm on call 24 hours a day, um, and quite rightly so, as Chief Constable. I'm a volunteer, so I, that's why I ask for no sympathy, because I love my job. I, I'll enjoy maybe not being on call all the time, and uh, not having to have two phones all the time, you know, one for work and one for home, um, and just relax a bit, and then just see what the uh, the rest of life uh, brings me safe in the knowledge that I'm handing it over to a, a fabulous new chief that will take Thames Valley onwards and onwards.